I'm Tim Boffman, and this is The Skinny. From the Fatheads Eyewear Studios in Speedway, Indiana, this is The Skinny. Brought to you by Toyota, Rhino Classifieds, General Tire, and Dream Giveaway. This segment of The Skinny is brought to you by Toyota. Welcome to another exciting episode here of The Skinny. Ken Stout and the track dude sitting right alongside Mr. Michael Young. It is bright and early here in Speedway, Indiana. Those guys love it when they can drag my fat butt in here and get me going first thing in the morning. But it is a beautiful, crisp morning outside in the 30s, I think 37 degrees or so. Uh, for a chubby guy, I actually really love that weather, Michael. I will say that the show may be a little rough today because <laughs> he, he can't already remember t- basic things. So <laughs> it happens. Yeah, if it's, it's a little, slow, it's a little, us, little foggy us, yeah, in yeah, there. A little foggy. <laughs> so the way it goes. Sitting alongside, and will join us here this morning is one of the silent heroes. You never hear too much about him until all of a sudden you need him. His name is Tim Boffman. He is the senior. Director of Track Safety and Medical uh, for IndyCar, AMR, if you will, and uh, has also been a fire firefighter for some 40 years. Am no. I correct yes. in that? 30, 40 years? Thir- I retired uh, two and a half years ago from the Indianapolis Fire Department after uh, 32 years of service. So a long, long time. One of those uh, first responders, and, and speaking of that, was actually at 9-11, on the next day, keep in mind he was here in Indianapolis when it happened, but uh, on day two was was part of the efforts there to help a lot of people, and uh, we appreciate your service. We appreciate what you and, and all of your colleagues do. I'm, you know, it's, uh, it's well, a rare breed for much. sure. Yep. Thank you. So how did this all start? How did you get involved with IndyCar? Obviously a firefighter forever, and have seen and done and, and probably – one of the most unsung jobs that a person can do and then to find yourself as a firefighter in in Indianapolis to working at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway and then now the director of safety. Well, I grew up in Indianapolis, east side, uh, how high school kid. Uh, uh, Scott Rimke and I grew up. Wow. It goes back together, back to how days. But uh, I went to... uh, a Methodist Hospital paramedic program in 1981, and uh, was pursuing my paramedicine, uh, uh, you know, uh, skill set. And part of that program was to come out to the Speedway, and work somewhat like an internship. And you know, we first aid stations, take care of the infield, the old infield, uh, you know, at at IMS. And from there, the passion of racing and everything just continued. And they end up hiring me to work in the garage area as a paramedic and then in the pits. And as it rolled through for years, I, you know, then I continued on and got hired by the fire department in 1987. And in parallel, I did both things. I, I did racing and the fire department and paramedic work. And my first race was 1982 at Indianapolis Motor Speedway working that event. And then... Um, just one thing rolled into another as my career advanced, and they, um, I got tagged out to work the Hoosier 100 in 1980 or 1991, and there was a horrific accident there. And I tell everybody it's virtually used every trauma skill set that, that, that we knew at the time. Um, and um, Dr. Bach heard about it, who was the medical director for IndyCar at that time and and IMS, and he basically said, would you want to be a paramedic on our safety team? So in 1992, I worked actually on the track my first year on the safety team. And that's how, you know, it just flowed from there the whole time. You know, obviously, we started traveling in 96. Um, IMS was incredible at that time because we had the Brickyard, we had the 500, we had Formula One. You know, it was it was getting all these different flavors of racing, um, you know, in one you know venue. But then we started traveling in '96, and now we're taking it, you know, taking it on the road, you know, and uh, uh, juggling family, juggling racing, juggling my career. Uh, I, I was just very fortunate to to have all those opportunities. As the traveling began, was that the first time that a medical team actually traveled with a series or a circuit for the entire season? No. Actually, um, the the CART safety team, uh, 
back when, if you remember, Lon Bromley and, uh, and Davey and th- that group uh, were traveling with CART. Uh, that was with Trammell, and, and Alvy was with that group. You know, it was when, when there was somewhat of a split going on. So th- those folks actually started in the early 80s. Um, and uh, about the same time, it was just in a parallel different time frame because we were working just indie at that time until we started traveling in 96. Yeah, such a uh, developed skill set. Um, and, and the fans at home might not, it's, it's not something I guess you would cross your mind unless you were actually uh, racing one of the cars or if you had a child or something racing uh, an open wheel car, something where they slide their legs down into and, and the seat is actually part of the car and your body becomes part of that seat. I mean, it, you're basically entombed inside of that car uh, to strap yourself in to deal with the G-forces and, and maintain control of the car and keep them as safe as possible. But, you know, the, the fans at home, until maybe you see something bad happen, you know, you don't think of, oh, my goodness, how are they going to get that person out of that car? So <laughs> it's such a developed skill set that you guys have had to learn and maintain and get better at all along the way that um, I'm sure that for mothers and fathers and the racers across the land, we're really happy to hear that you're going to travel with a series because you need those experienced people to get that driver out. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's truly a, a different skill set, as you mentioned. But what we look for, people who have mastered uh, the, the firefighting, the driver extraction, the rescue work, um, have experience to the point where they understand that they work um, – in, in, in very tight time windows. Um, for us to be successful, we have to be at our best every time it happens. And so when we look for people to do this, you know, and they come to me, we look for people. It's, it's an ongoing process. Um, we look for those folks who have mastered that skill set of being a firefighter, being a paramedic, uh, and understand that things happen in such a compressed time period in racing that uh, uh, they have to be successful. And, and quite frankly, uh, people ask us why we do that. And, and, and it's probably the challenge, the challenge to operate at this level, the best you can be as a firefighter, as a paramedic, as a rescue technician, and do it in such a way uh, that it can make a difference uh, when a lot of times folks wouldn't survive these incidents. Absolutely. I mean, you go... Look, quite frankly, from sitting in a truck drinking a cup of coffee to wide open trying to save somebody's life in a split second. Yes. Yeah, it's it's different. Uh, obviously, my career in the fire service, we can't put a firehouse on every block, corner of every block. Uh, so nationally, the standard is four to seven minutes response time, you know, to get you know, a, fire, a fire truck to somebody's house or an ambulance to somebody's house and need an emergency. In IndyCar racing with the MR IndyCar safety team, it's not minutes, it's seconds. So we literally are sitting trackside, which that doesn't happen. We don't have fire trucks and ambulances sitting on the interstate or sitting in an intersection waiting for a crash. We're sitting trackside, and we actually get to see the incident happen, which is a huge part of our success because we see the mechanism of injury and understand um, what potentially could happen and what potentially has happened to that driver. And so it, it, it's very key. But we, uh, we do work very hard to make sure that uh, they have a term called the golden hour in trauma. And the golden hour is from the time the injury happens to the time they're in surgery. We don't save people. We don't save people in, you know, uh, out, you know trauma patients out on the street. We get them to surgery and and it's part of a system and with that system we try to narrow our window so that we give the surgeons and the hospitals and the tertiary care an opportunity to save that life uh very very important stuff it's great stuff man again uh, we can't thank you enough and we have a lot more to cover here with you sure pick that brain of yours i know you've seen a lot you've been in a lot of different situations so we're going to take a quick break here and we'll be right back on the other side with more very important You said a little foggy, right, Michael? A lot foggy. (laughs) A lot foggy. A lot foggy. (laughs) We'll be back in a minute.
This segment of The Skinny is brought to you by Dream Giveaway. Dream Giveaway has been giving away high-end American muscle cars to raise money for charity since 2007. Dream Giveaway is known for giving away classic and new muscle and paying the federal taxes so the winners don't have to. For $25, you can jump in the game, and part of that goes to charity. You'll have a chance at winning some of the coolest cars on the planet. Check it out at dreamgiveaway.com. Welcome back to The Skinny. Ken Stout here, trying to wake up, apparently, uh, stumbling with all the words. Michael's going to carry the show from here on out. I'm just going to go finish my coffee. See you later. (laughs) Here we go, folks. Tim Boffman is our guest, and uh, Tim has seen and done so much with the NTT IndyCar series. And we touched upon, in the first segment, the reaction time once an incident happens. When you see a yellow, I've always wondered. We have three track safety trucks that that man several people in each when the time of caution comes out how quickly do you assess what's going on as you approach an incident and what are the steps that you take each and every time and we must remember things have changed now with the aero screen so i'm i'm sure that process has changed ever so slightly but i'm when you're inside are you always ready i like at any second something could happen or is it casual, but as soon as a, a caution comes out, maybe like at a firehouse, you hear the alarm go off and everybody jumps into action? Well, uh, first of all, we have 16 team members go to every race, cover those three trucks that you mentioned. And there is different protocols based on road courses, street courses, and ovals. So the response is different. Um, on ovals, which were where we started cutting our teeth in 96, you know, it's it's very clear cut what that response is a triple yellow 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 goes out um we're there we may not see it you remember that an indy car going on a super speedway is traveling uh, about a football field a second and a crash zone for an indy car is about a thousand feet at 220 mile an hour so sometimes that crash happens before they ever get to us and then they they end up right in front of us or they slide by us or it happens right in front of us, and we got to follow them a, a thousand feet to where they come to rest. Our first truck goes to the the car that was involved. The second truck goes to the point of impact. The third truck then fills the void in between, and we basically work from the, the two endpoints and take care of the incident. But that first truck is key, obviously. Um, with that driver, the, as we roll out, we see the incident go down. Things that we look at as we visualize what's going on, you know, is the, is the driver's head up? Are they awake? Are they trying to do something purposeful? Uh, because that's part of that assessment of whether, and that's changed that with the aero screen because we really can't see the driver's head like we used to be able to, which is a great thing, by the way. Uh, the So what we see is, is the driver awake or appear to be moving? Is the car on fire? Is the car upright? Because all those things change our response. And if we have multiple cars, we're pulling out and I'm driving safety too. I'm looking to say, okay, he's moving. He's moving. They're fine. I keep driving until I find something that, that's worthy of me making that initial stop. If there are multiple cars, those trucks will then break protocol and, and will start splitting up and they'll go to the other driver. So we always try to get a paramedic or one of our team members with every driver. They're, uh, they're great drivers, wonderful drivers. Sometimes they're bad pedestrians. So we want to make sure we're with them even when they get out of the car uh, so they don't walk out in front of traffic, walk out in front of another response vehicle or something out on the racetrack. So we always try to get somebody there, there immediately to do that initial assessment. Sometimes it's immediate. You know, our, our trucks are following the crash. People are like, they're right on top of it. The car's sliding to us, basically. It's like a, a catcher with a catcher's mitt saying, you know, put it here. We're here right here. Other times there's a gap or a void. And you've asked me about that offline before. Uh, and people say, where's the safety team? Well, they're so used to seeing us there that quick. There are times when uh, there's a bigger gap between where our trucks are and where the incident happened. So there is a strategy of where our trucks are parked. You know, we try to put them 
using historical information, using the experts out there, the Tony Kotmans and those folks to say, hey, this is a, a high speed corner. Uh, we, we built a track like this. You know, this is probably a place where we want to have a safety truck in this runoff if we have a, a big hit here, you know, the opportunity to save a life there. Sometimes odd things happen on racetracks where there's big hits where they weren't expected. You know, we look at the Roman Grosjean crash in Formula One. That was a straightaway. Two cars got together and 90 degrees into the wall. It was a gap between response positions. Those things do happen. I was thinking about the incident that happened in race one in Detroit this year where Felix Rosenquist's car and they had a failure with the throttle. Mm -hmm. And he went full throttle into a corner where we don't normally expect crashes. With the aero screen now in place, and, and that certainly did its job, how did you assess that when he's buried a car length into the tire barrier? So good example of a place where it's a technical part of the race course, normally not high impacts, but yet something happened. A mechanical failure caused that big impact. So he, he goes in at a lot higher speed. It wasn't a position where we had a safety truck right on top of it because it was in that technical area versus a high-speed impact point or projected high-speed endpoint. So we were there. Um, everything worked. The track design with the tires, the way even with the concrete walls that actually and fence that were actually destroyed, they did their job. But more importantly, his car submarined up into those tires, hit the fence, Tires went over the top of his head, uh, were on top of it. The car actually ended up resting, you know, about a 45-degree noseward up. Um, and, yeah, it was, uh, it, it was definitely a challenge. And it was the first driver that we extracted uh, in, a, a, in a real incident with the aero screen. And uh, we thought that it went extremely well uh, with the fact that we, we had trained probably hundreds and hundreds of drills um, knowing – that the aero screen was going to make a challenge. It's like kind of like working in a hole. You have to reach down. Everything's below ground. And so we, we had to design equipment differently. The backboard we put on the driver has stri lift straps so that we can use our body mechanics better. Um, it, it secures the driver more like a bucket uh, so that it, when you do lift them up, you're not going to cause further injury. Um, and the fact that... All the we used to have four or five sets of hands down in the cockpit. Somebody taking the steering wheel, somebody doing the, the straps, um, taking the head surround off. You can only get about two sets of hands in that in that position now. So all of our protocols as far as driver extraction changed. Um, with that incident, fortunately, you know Felix was not injured seriously. Uh, we found out that all of our practice and all of our preparation. Um, it, it, it was successful and the fact that we know that we can do that with uh, with the aero screen in play and uh, there was there's a lot of work that went into that and and you know I have to thank Jay Fry initially when they came up with doing the aero screen and Red Bull he tagged me on and said we need you to sit in on these meetings you know from the design point they asked me, what do we need? I brought them a backboard, what we normally use. We measured the cockpit, 21 and a half inches. We made sure that that opening stayed 21 and a half inches because that's what we need to get a driver straight up and out without turning their head or their neck or their back and injuring them, potentially injuring them further. So um, all that went into play. They designed the thing, and as soon as we had prototypes, we were taking it out to Hamal Strong, Glenn Burney, and we were cutting it. We were finding out how strong it was, finding out what the, how it was affixed to the car, uh, how the, the, the plexiglass or the polyglass was, is, was affixed to the car and what we needed to do to remove it if we had to. Uh, so there was a lot of drill, a lot of preparation that went into play, and those all went on top of our normal protocols. So uh, we, we feel it, it worked out real well. and. and and Delara and IndyCar and, and Ganassi was involved in this too. They got us a tub, 2012 tub that was damaged uh, beyond repair. Uh, they actually put a, an actual aero screen on it, uh, frame, pollock, the whole nine yards, and we drill, drill, drill. It goes with us to every race. And it's not something that we did one time and just pushed it off the side. We literally do it almost every race weekend. And we do it in January when we do our team training. We'll do it 
30, 40 times. We'll take a quick break here. We have Tim Boffman in the studio here, the Senior Director of Track Safety and Medical, giving us some great insight on the preparation that he and his team goes through to make sure our drivers out there in IndyCar are safe. We have plenty more to come. Stay with us. We'll be right back. This segment of The Skinny has been brought to you by General Tire. It's more than just a slogan. Anywhere is possible with General Tire. General Tire's Grabber X3 Mud Terrain Tire offers aggressive styling and is engineered for durability with innovative performance features that are ready to carry you through extreme mud, dirt, and rock-covered terrain. For extreme traction that's ready for anything and rugged styling to match, look no further than the Grabber X3. Make your anywhere possible by visiting GeneralTire.com today. This segment of The Skinny is brought to you by Rhino Classifieds. Tired of all those ads and random stuff that shows up when you're looking to buy or sell your car parts? Rhino Classifieds was created just for you. Welcome to a streamlined buying and selling app created by racers for racers and race fans. Modified cars, classic cars, race cars, that special big block you need. The trailer to move your baby around the country in. We got you at rhino.co. Welcome back to The Skinny. We have a great guest on here. This is Tim Boffman, Senior Director of Track Safety and Medical, giving us some insights on what the AMR team uh, goes through whenever an incident happens on the track, how they prepare, and then how they deal with that incident. Some, some great insights, some great stories here to help everybody understand everything that you guys go through um, we're going to pick out a couple of incidences here. Uh, I'm going to pick the James Hinchcliffe one uh, for a couple of reasons. One, he was on the show and we had a, an opportunity to talk to him about that, but his unique situation of actually being impaled. So he was pinned inside of the car. Mm -hmm. And of course, that was before Aero Screen, which would have made it, who knows, uh, how much more difficult. But um, when you look at a situation like that, uh, you constantly think, I'm, I'm thinking, well, can they cut the car apart? But you really can't cut the car apart. I mean, there's a person inside of it. And, of course, those tubs are so incredibly strong. What was the scenario there with, with James? So, James, as we know the story, obviously, um, the the uh, suspension part, which kind of acted like a spear when the car went in at the correct angle into the safer barrier, actually penetrated all the way through the side tub and then went into his body and then actually came out and went into the tub again. So he was really, he was uh, skewered basically on, on that part. James was initially awake, um, talking, um, noticed that his color was not so good, but sometimes color's not good just because they just had a 110 G impact or 70 G impact and the body catching up. As I went to take him out of the car, he wouldn't come out. It, it was, uh, boy, what's going on here? Oh, so you guys didn't know initially? No, no. So nothing was working that normally worked. We, you know, we, we take the foot box off to the shock cover to look at the feet, make sure there's nothing in there. The pedals, the feet aren't stuck in the pedals. Took the head surround off. Uh, they were talking to James, assessing him. And then as they went to take him out of the car, um, he just wouldn't come out. Well, then, there, then the, the, now we got to find out, actually put hands down around, you know, his, his, his hips, his legs, find out what, it, what's going on here. Because the way that the piece went in, it went in and then was flush with the tub. So you couldn't oh. see it from the outside. Oh, my goodness. So um, they went down and came up and obviously found, you know, that he was bleeding. Um, and then they realized, well, we've got something else going on differently here. So a, a very small piece of this a suspension, and it literally turned into a spear. The, the heim jump on the end broke off. It actually become a point, sure. and that's what penetrated all the way through. Well, it stuck in the other side of the car. Well, taking the, the spreader from the Homaltro spreader, which spreads out to 32 and a half inches, they spread that just enough to release that and heard a pop and release that point that was stuck in the other side of the car. All of our training, and training still today, is that when you have somebody impaled or on an object, you don't remove it. 
simply because it's there and it may be up against a blood vessel and stopping it from bleeding more. And you could do more damage by removing it. So in our training, trauma training today, you still remove, you take the object with them to the, to the hospital. Well, we couldn't load up an whole Indy car. So we had to break, break our training and they basically, when they heard that pop and felt a release, they said, we've got to pull him off of here. Or he's going to, you know, bleed out in this car. Um, so that pop occurred. Guys were ready. They put him, put him in, in, you know, got him out of there, basically slid him off of off the, the suspension piece or the impalement. Mm. And um, literally from, from this is James' account of it, because he did it, it was incredible that how much he wanted to talk to every person that took care of him. Every, and he wanted to know what happened, because obviously at a certain point he, he didn't know what was being done. But it, it, his, there's decisions that were made to take him directly to the trauma center at Methodist uh, there instead of stopping at the infield care center. Uh, there were decisions on, we got to slide him off of this because if we had messed around trying to cut it, trying to pull it loose, trying to get it loose in somewhere, we're talking seconds here. And James will, will tell you this is that um, he was the lead, he was in a resuscitation mode from the time when the elevators opened in the, the operating room at, um, to the point where he, he had lost all of his blood. And if they had gone 15, 20 seconds, another minute, if we had taken two more minutes, we have a different outcome. And so James, um, you know, he, he did, you know, Mike Yates was head of the team at that time. Mike was there and Matt Stewart, who's currently on the team, took care of him. Um, they, they did some very incredible things in the back of that ambulance that, quite frankly, people talk about today and say, why did you, how did you, what did you think of this? And, uh, and, and it was all trying to stop the bleeding you hear the stop the bleed and tourniquets are coming back in the form of trying to save people's lives. Police officers are carrying tourniquets. We use those basic things, uh, uh, but a big tourniquet and stopping the bleed by holding pressure mm. to give him a few more seconds to get him to that operating room where he could be resuscitated and survived. We uh, remembered the 20th anniversary, obviously, of 9-11. We lost Dan Weldon. 10 years ago. So that anniversary came up as well. And I think about that day and what had happened and how horrific and how quickly everything went wrong. <clears throat> Describe, if you would, your time with being in New York City the day after 9-11 and then being on the scene with Dan's incident. Well, actually, at, the, at Dan's incident, I was up in, I was actually fire control. So I was overseeing the response and so I had trucks out there. And um, I, w when I look at the parallel between the two things, it was something that your mind just doesn't uh, grasp all the details um, and, and, and stay with you. And a few, few weeks ago when they did the 10 year on Dan, you know, it was we were looking and I was like, gosh, I remember that now. I remember that now. And same way of 9-11, you know, we there were certain aspects until they started showing it that our, our brains, and then maybe this is a, a thing that, that God blessed us with, you know, and the fact that our brains don't remember those things on purpose, you know, and, and it helps us cope and, and move forward. But the Dan Weldon crash, there were seven cars burning. There was a driver significantly injured, 17 cars involved, um, and it literally looked like a large commercial jetliner crash on a racetrack that's debris everywhere fires people up and walking other people seriously injured so but it happened right in front of us you know and then in new york if you look at it you're sitting there thinking uh, what we had these 210 story towers down and there's nothing left and I remember getting off the bus 15 hours after the towers came down and walked into a, a, a dust pile and you couldn't see anything. And there was, you know, fire, there's still smoke coming out of the pile. And, and it was all very surreal. It's like, and, and there was a comparison 
you know, when you look at those things and, and how we deal with them. And, and I, I will tell you that all first responders probably sometime in their career have dealt with, you know, something very traumatic. But quite frankly, that's what we've trained for. You know, that's what we, that's what we were built for. That's why we were designed to go out and do those types of things. Um, after 35, 40 years of doing it, you don't realize when you're that 20 year old kid saying, Hey, sign me up, put me in coach. I'm ready to go. And I'm ready to go, go, go that the impact that it has and how, how we deal with that, those types of things. But for the most part, you know, I couldn't be any more proud of how our team responds, um, how proud I am to be a member of that team. And, and the whole response to nine 11, the whole response to what we do is it's uh, you know, it, we look at those as opportunities for us to excel as professionals. And if we excel and people live, we have a better outcome. Incredible efforts, incredible stories, uh, and incredible situations. It's wow. It's just fascinating uh, to listen to what you guys do, how you prepare. Can't thank you enough, man, for, for all the effort and, and an endless task. It's, uh, it's also very good to hear. I, it was actually going to be one of, one of my questions, but you answered it inadvertently uh, whenever you started talking about the design of the aero screen, the fact that they do include you guys in some of that design and, and get your input about what it's going to change from your end in terms of safety. Certainly the, the whole premise is to keep the driver safer, but you know, after an incident, what's it going to do to, to uh, make it more difficult to extract them? I even wonder if there's further development that could be taken uh, in terms of maybe some way a, a quick removal of that arrow screen to help you guys if in fact I mean given a, a James Hinchcliffe situation where in a matter of seconds you could pop that off and get yourself some more working room but sh certainly that affects the whole rest of the car well f first and foremost um, as a first responder out on the street we get very little information about you know, cars that are you know, built in factories, you know, by the you know, big motor companies, we kind of learn to deal with this is what you see, this is what you, you know, how, how do we work through it systematically, um, knowing the materials, knowing the design, and just applying that. But yeah, I'm sure there's some people that are a lot smarter in the engineering side of things that are or looking at ways of improving the aero screen, whether it's on the new tub going forward. You got to remember, it was retrofitted onto the 2012 tub, so there Very were some point. lot of restrictions that went on to make that work, and um, you know, and, and it's pretty phenomenal how they did it. But imagine giving a blank sheet of paper and a design a new car, incorporate those types of things. It's pretty exciting, and that's probably, you know, if you want to frame that. In the 35, 40 years I've been doing this, we had concrete walls. We went to safer barriers. We've we've had so many safety. We've had the Hans device. Uh, we've so many safety measures that have uh, have, have evolved, and it, and that's the cool part about racing, is that it's always evolving. It's always pushing. Even though there's this competition, everybody sees on TV and says, "Well, they're racing." Man, the engineer folks working behind the scenes. Uh, the, the decision makers to, to make things safer, um, you know, and I, I, I have to mention, we are our primary sponsor, you mentioned is AMR and AMR has been a great partner for us in the fact that anything we've needed, they've said, well, how can we help you? You know, whether it's a, a certain type of device or a scope that we can put down to, to get an airway on a, on a driver that we have problems accessing a monitor to monitor their, their oxygen levels, their CO2 levels, all those things, because that driver now is in this that may be in there a little longer than what they were a few years ago. Now we have these devices, you know, through our sponsor and, and through their support that, that helps us do that. And, and, and I think it's a system and an we're a, we're, a, we're a component of it, but I think track design, car design, our team, um, the medical care that's set up prior to having a helicopter, you know, when it, we're distanced from out, it's all part of a, a network or a series of things that lead to our success. So there are a lot more people behind the scenes than just our 16 people and our, our, our two doctors and four nurses. I mean, uh, and it, it, it the way that we're embraced by the racing community and supported and 
basically a lot of people say, we would like to have a team like yours. And, you know, some of my, my team members worked recently with the SRX, you know, series that came up. We all had some backgrounds, some NASCAR stuff. Uh, one of my team members is now the director of safety for IMSA. So a lot of our cross training and things that are going on back and forth are going to make us better. I see that sprint car sitting there in front of you right now. And I think the biggest area where we can improve in racing is small tracks around the country. You know, we've lost a lot of friends and a lot of drivers and, and we've had first responders hurt. And I think if, if, if we could work to, to improve that safety at those levels, uh, we're going to save more lives and, and hopefully have better outcomes and, and keep racing fun. Once again, Tim Balpin with us, Senior Director of Track Safety and Medical. Some great insights, and uh, I can't thank these guys enough. If you go out to a racetrack, it doesn't matter if you're a fan or if you're a racer, a crew member, whatever it may be, these guys are always there. You'll bump into one sooner or later. Take a moment, just say thanks, because without them, we would have lost a lot of our friends. Tim, thank you very much for spending the time with us this morning, man. Great, great show. It was my pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, bud. We'll see you next time. Thanks for being with us here on The Skinny. This episode has been brought to you by Toyota, Rhino Classifieds, Dream Giveaway, and General Tire. For the latest in sunglasses, optical frames, accessories, and apparel, be sure to check out fatheads.com. That's fatheads with a Z. Production facilities provided by Fatheads Eyewear Studios. All rights reserved.